All right, in this video, I wanna talk about type one and type two errors. These relate to hypothesis testing. I typically wait until I teach t-test to teach these types of errors, but really there's nothing specific about t-test that you need for these errors. These are relevant when we talk about z-test or one prop z-test, any type of hypothesis testing you're doing, you can learn about type one and type two errors. The only reason I put it off is because when you first learn hypothesis testing, you as a student are typically pretty overwhelmed. It's just confusing, there's so much information. So I like to wait a little while, there's no real hurry to get this information out there. Type one and type two errors. So when I talk about type one and type two errors, we gotta think about what possible conclusions, so maybe conclusions of hypothesis testing. And maybe you recall from previous videos that there's really only two different things you can do. Either you can reject your null hypothesis, and as a reminder, this means your claim is true. Or there's not enough evidence. You fail to reject your null hypothesis, and which, in which case, can't say if the claim is true or not. And that seems kind of strange. It seems like you should conclude that either the claim is true or the claim is false. But the logic of hypothesis testing doesn't allow you to do that. It only allows you to come to one of these two conclusions. Either you reject the null hypothesis, you say the claim is true, or you fail to reject the null hypothesis, can't say that the claim is true. It's worth pointing out that the way you get there, and I've made this chart before, but I'm gonna do it again, is if we're talking about the p-value method, you're saying that your p-value is less than alpha, then you reject the null hypothesis, and if your p-value is greater than alpha, then you fail to reject the null hypothesis. And don't worry about equality, I'll make sure that it never happens. If we're not doing the p-value method and we're instead doing the classical method, then it's the test statistic in the rejection region, which causes you to come to this first conclusion, and it's the test statistic not in the rejection region that causes you to come to the second conclusion. But really, red and blue, that's just meant to be review. When I talk about type one and type two errors, I'm just talking about the conclusions. And there's only two of them. Either you reject the null or you don't reject the null. Either you say the claim is true or you can't say the claim is true. What I want you to think about is realities, right? Either the claim is true or the claim is false, right? So either the claim is true or the claim is false. You'll never know whether the claim is true or claim is false, or just know what you conclude. But in reality, one of these things is the case that you live in. One of these is certain. So suppose, let's do an example. Example, I have a drug that, uh, I don't know, makes you faster, that I claim makes you faster. Either it does or it doesn't, right? Either my drug works or my drug does not work. I have this drug, I claim that it makes people faster. Maybe the claim is true and it really does make people faster. Or maybe the claim is false and it doesn't make people faster. We have no idea. Our job as a statistician is to either come to this conclusion or to come to this conclusion. All right, so there's kind of four different possibilities. There's these two different conclusions. You can come to this first conclusion if the claim really is true. or you come to the second conclusion if the claim is true. Or you might be in the case where the claim is false, in which case you come to the first conclusion or the second conclusion. And to be clear, you'll never know whether the claim is true or the claim is false. This is just a hypothetical idea. It could be here, or it could be here. If the claim really is true, if my drug really does make people faster, and I do this hypothesis testing and I reject the null hypothesis, that's good news. If the claim really is true, then I, the statistician, am hoping that I'd reject the null hypothesis and say that the claim is true because we know that the claim really is true. If that happens, that's good news. Maybe happy face here. Right, that'd be great. If the claim is really false, if my drug does not make people faster, then best we can possibly do is fail to reject the null hypothesis. Remember, we never say that the claim is false in our conclusion. Either we say the claim is true or we can't say the claim is true. So if the claim really is false, best case scenario is that we don't say that it's true. That's a happy face as well. So when we say that the claim is true, we're hoping that in reality the claim is true. And when we don't say that the claim is true, we're hoping in reality the claim is false. But it's possible 
that we're not in one of those two quadrants. It's possible that the claim is really false and we reject the null hypothesis and say that it's true. That's bad. We come to the wrong conclusion. If you incorrectly reject the null hypothesis, you make what's called a type one error. That's a bit misleading calling it an error because it makes it sound like you did something wrong. You, the statistician, didn't do anything wrong. It's just the data that you had led you to the wrong conclusion. If you incorrectly reject the null hypothesis, another way to think about that is you say the claim is true when really the claim is false. It's called a type one error. And again, I know I've said this before, but it's a key point is that we'll never know if we make a type one error. We just want to talk hypothetically about it, what a type one error would be. And what it would be is if the claim is false. You'll never know that it's false. But if the claim is false, and we say that the claim is true, that's a type one error. We'll never know if the claim is false because to know if the claim is false, we'd have to give the drug to everybody in the population. And the population's too big. We'll never get information about the population parameters. We just estimate them based on our sample statistics. Anyways, if we incorrectly reject the null, we're making a type one error. It might not surprise you that if we incorrectly fail to reject the null hypothesis. So this is where the claim is true, where the drug really does work, where my drug really does make you faster. And you, the statistician, are like, eh, we can't say that it's true. That's what's called a type two error. And what I want you to understand is first, that these things exist, that there's such a thing as a type one and a type two error. And then I want you to understand what their definitions are. A type one error is when you incorrectly reject the null hypothesis. A type two error is when you incorrectly fail to reject the null hypothesis. And then in addition to just knowing what they are, I want you to know a couple of facts about them. So the first fact is that, maybe this is facts. Type one error is a big deal. Whereas a type two error is not. Let me try to explain why. Imagine what you're saying. Imagine this is a more realistic scenario. So not a drug that makes people faster, but uh, I don't know, a drug that I claim cures cancer, right? Or, or that lowers people's blood pressure might be a better example. I have this drug and I claim that it lowers people's blood pressure. Well, I can't just go sell in my drug, right? It has to pass all sorts of clinical trials. The government has to be convinced that my drug works before I'm allowed to sell it in the United States. Right? So imagine that I have this drug and I say that it lowers people's blood pressure and you, the statistician, are going to decide if I'm right or not. So you go and test it. If my drug really does not work, but you say that it does work, then you're committing a type one error. Think about the implications of that. You, the statistician, are saying that the drug works. You're vouching for my drug. That means I can sell my drug. I can give my drug to millions of people with high blood pressure, and they take the drug thinking that it's gonna lower their blood pressure because this drug has been clinically trusted, tested and proven to lower blood pressure. If you're saying that my drug works, it better work. It's a big deal if you say that my drug works and it does not work. That'd be a huge deal. But imagine if it was a type two error. Imagine that I'm selling this drug and it really does work now. Now my claim is true. So my drug really does lower people's blood pressure and you, the statistician, come up with this conclusion. Well, think about what you're saying. You're not saying that the claim is false. You're not saying that the drug does not work. You're just saying, I can't say that it does work. And that's not a big deal. You're not saying the drug does not work. You're just saying, I can't say that it does work. What would happen in that situation is I, the manufacturer of the drug, would be like, yeah, all right, I better test it further. Maybe instead of giving the drug to 100 patients in a sample, I should give it to 10,000. You, the statistician, are just saying more evidence is needed here. You never say that the claim is false, so you're not telling me to get rid of my drug. You're just saying, I can't say, there's not enough evidence to say that your drug works yet. And then it's up to me, the manufacturer of the drug, to test it further. Type 2 errors, no big deal. They're benign errors, whereas type 1 errors are a big deal. That's the first thing to know about the difference between type one and type two errors. The second thing to know is that you get to choose the probability that you make a type one error. So a type one error, rejecting the null hypothesis when you should not reject the null hypothesis, the probability that that happens is something you get to choose. And it turns out something you know, it's alpha. Alpha is the probability of committing a type one error. So the way to think about it is type one errors are the ones that are a big deal. So it's important that you don't make a type one error. So you, the statistician, get to choose how likely it is that you make a type one error. The reason a type one error is alpha is because the idea is if my claim is false, then I would expect my test statistic, my sample average, to be the same as my population baseline average. But since it's just a sample average, it could be a little bit greater or a little bit less than. 
I'm only going to reject my null hypothesis, say that the claim is true, if my test statistic is way out in the rejection region, if my p-value is less than alpha. The only way I'll get a p-value less than alpha is if the test statistic is way out here, is further to the right than the area of alpha. How likely is that to happen? Well, it would be exactly alpha. Right? The probability that I committed type 1 error, a type 1 error would be if the test statistic should have been in the middle, but just by dumb luck it ends up way off to the side. How likely is that that will happen? Well, just whatever area you assign alpha to be equal to. If you followed that, great. If you don't, as far as our class, what you need to know is alpha is the probability that you committed type 1 error. And you get to choose alpha, right? Alpha is one minus your level of confidence. So if you want to be 99% certain, that means alpha is 1%. It means there's a 1% chance that you make a type 1 error. You might wonder, wait a minute, if I get to choose the probability to make a type 1 error, why not just make alpha super duper small? Why not make my... Uh, level of certainty 99.9999, then alpha is 0 0.0000001, I think, if I count out the right amount of zeros there. The reason you don't want to do that is because the probability of committing a type 2 error, spelling committing differently, I think I spelled it wrong up here, whatever, a type 2 error, is, and this is going to sound more com complicated than it is, inversely proportional to alpha. What I'm saying here is if alpha is really, really small, then it's more likely you'll make a type 2 error. If you let alpha get kind of big, then it's less likely that you'll make a type 2 error. These are kind of a trade-off. You can't just make alpha super duper small because then you're making the probability of a type 2 error really large. That kind of makes sense. You can think about alpha as how extreme of a result that you need to reject the null hypothesis. If alpha is super duper small, then you need a really extreme result if you want to reject the null hypothesis. So what I'm saying is if alpha is really, really small, we probably won't reject the null hypothesis. We'll probably fail to reject the null hypothesis, regardless of which reality we're in. If we make alpha really small, it's more likely we'll make a type 2 error. So what you need to know about a type 1 and type 2 error, first the thing that is things that exist. Type 1 error is when you reject the null hypothesis, but you shouldn't have. And when I say shouldn't have, there's quotation marks around that. You didn't do anything wrong. It's just that it turns out that the claim was false, but you said the claim was true. And type 2 error is kind of the reverse of that statement. It turns out that the claim is true. You'll never know that the claim really was true, and you just couldn't say that the claim is true. First thing is knowing what a type 1 and type 2 error is. Second thing is understanding that the probability that you commit a type 1 error is alpha. And third thing is understanding that type 1 and type 2 errors are what are called inversely proportional. As far as importance, I'd say by far the most important is just to be able to identify these things. I think exclusively or damn near exclusively in this class, all you'll have to do with type 1 and type 2 errors is recognize them. I'll say, what would a type 1 error be in, this, in the context of this problem? And if it's in the context of this problem, you'd be like, let's see, a type 1 error. That's when I incorrectly reject the null hypothesis. I incorrectly say that the claim is true. What a type 1 error would be is if uh, you, I, someone, I conclude drug makes people faster when really it does not. Now you incorrectly said that the drug works. You incorrectly said that the claim is true. Conversely, a type 2 error would be I don't conclude the drug makes people faster. Remember, it's not that you're concluding the drug makes people slower or that you're not concluding that the drug doesn't make people faster, you're just not concluding that it does make people faster. I don't conclude that the drug makes people faster, but really it does. The claim really is true, the drug really does make people faster, but I don't say that it does, that's a type two error. That's all I got on type one and type two errors.